Hello, Minnesota. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm glad you could join us today. It's April 12th. It's a beautiful Saturday spring here in Minnesota. I love it. Loving the sunshine, loving the warm weather. We got a great show today, but before we bring on our guests, I just want to thank the viewing audience. Thank SCC Television Studios and SPNN for broadcasting us live. We broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock. And uh, we just really appreciate you tuning in and telling your friends and your family about the Tony Hernandez Show. And a reminder that our YouTube channel is YouTube backslash Tony Hernandez Show. Uh, you can go there and subscribe if you want. And again, thank you for uh, tuning in. We have a wonderful show today. We have uh, two guests that we're going to be bringing on. The first is Angie Hasek, and she was recently elected the chairwoman of the Minnesota College Republicans. And then after that, we have Minnesota State House candidate. Jen Wilson. She's running uh, for the State House in Egan's uh, 51B district. So we're going to learn about her, her campaign, and, and talk about some of the issues facing uh, the Minnesota legislature. Uh, so with that, I'm going to bring on our first guest, Angie Hasek. Uh, welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to, to be here. You. And uh, I must say, congratulations. Uh, you, made, uh, you made history, you made news, recently elected the chairwoman of the Minnesota College Republican. So congratulations for that. Thank you. And uh, when, when was the convention? Our election was last Saturday, April 5th, at the Minneapolis campus of St. Thomas. Okay. And so down, just right downtown So by the, by the law school there? Is yes, is. right across the street from there. Mm -hmm. And how many, were there a lot of people there? We had about 70 delegates and some alternates that were not able to be seated. And then probably 20 guests or so, so we were around 100, mm -hmm. which was a few people, fewer than last year, but still pretty good for attendance-wise. And you made you made some history, though, right? Because you're, you're the, is it the first uh, woman elected to this position or first woman in a while? First or? woman since 2009, but I'm the first woman from St. Thomas since the early 90s. And that also, I think, was the last time there were two consecutive St. Thomas chairs, or chairs from St. Thomas. And then um, we're the first brother-sister combo in state history, so that was kind of fun. That, that's right. So your brother was, he's the former former chair, uh, recently uh, stepped down. He's graduating, right? Correct. And then he has taken a position with Congressman Paulson and his campaign team. Mm -hmm. So he'll be working as a field staffer this year. Yeah, we had uh, we had Andrew on when he was a candidate. That's and then, right. And Danny Sermon. Uh, this is when we were back in the uh, the other studio, but we had the, the Minnesota College Republican debate broadcasted live right yes, here. Yes, so. the candidate. Debate. Both, I both him and that. Danny were, were great candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a fairly competitive race, but but Andrew uh, Andrew did win that election. And uh, can you talk about just uh, briefly? And we're going to talk more about you and, and Minnesota College Republicans. But what, what were some of the things that uh, Andrew was able to accomplish this last year? And you know, what were some of the highlights of that? Yeah. Well, I never realized how fun it would really be to work with a sibling. Like we worked together at St. Thomas. He was the chair. I was the vice chair. And just great teamwork, you know, he'd tackle some tasks, I'd tackle others, and then we'd collaborate, and we ran a great chapter, so very, a chapter that we're very proud of, and this past year, he's done a great job laying the groundwork. Um, for example, we started a chapter, or helped to start a chapter at Carleton, the home of Paul Wellstone, and we have like 30 members there, um, very proud of that. We've also helped strengthen the chapters in Winona. The University of Minnesota is thriving now. St. Thomas has maintained strength. So we look across the state, and the, the chapters will be very strong for an election year. Mm. And that, I think, was the most important thing he did. But he also left me with a lot of money, so that that's always very helpful going into an election year. Very thankful for that. And a few people that he brought on board, I brought on board. So I'm bringing a lot of experience, not just with myself, but with the other members of my team through this next year. So that's interesting. New chapter on, on Carleton uh, yes. campus. That's great. And I know that there's a, a chapter that was uh, recently started on the McAllister campus. Yep. And, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, just because a, a campus or their uh, prof professors and whatnot may be extremely liberal, that doesn't mean that the entire mm -mm. student body is. And I actually watched a, a video online and, and encouraged people to, to YouTube it, but Senator Rand Paul was on uh, the Berkeley campus in uh, Berkeley, California. I think I heard about that. And, you know, it just, he kind of looked like a fish out of water in a way. Mm -hmm. There's, there's Rand Paul, pretty, uh, you know, strict conservative libertarian. Yes. And there he is on the Berkeley. But he was getting, uh, 
uh, he got an ovation. People were, were cheering uh, for what he was saying because he, he was talking about the NSA, mm -hmm. um, our civil liberties, Fourth Amendment rights, and, and protection from, uh, you know, unwarranted searches and seizures. And, and so, you know, people do need to understand that conservatives have a lot of shared values as liberals or classic liberals and, and libertarians. And it's not exactly a, a right versus left uh, mm -hmm. dichotomy. And a lot of our chapters just range very differently politically. We have very Christian schools such as Bethel and Northwestern, Concordia and St. Paul. Mm. But then we have pretty moderate schools like St. Thomas. And then we have the very liberal, so McAllister, St. Olaf, um, Carleton. But there's always something that students can have in common with all students on their campus. There's mm -hmm. always an issue that riles people up and would get them to consider voting Republican. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're bringing on uh, Jen Wilson later on in the show, and it, it's glad to, to have you here. We had Hannah uh, Nicolette, who's running for the U.S. Senate. She was on last week, and you know, I just find it just uh, very encouraging to see more and more strong women standing up and taking part in public policy and in uh, the community and, and in politics. And so I definitely commend you both, and uh, you know I just think that that it's a great thing. But for people out there who who are watching, uh, who maybe are in high school or, or mm -hmm. younger that uh, may want to take part in the college Republicans uh, when they become your age, uh, can you describe to them a little bit about uh, like the process of not only becoming involved but uh, elevating to leadership and, and getting elected. Is, is it as hard and, and difficult as people think? Um, it kind of depends on the year. You know, we're always looking for great leaders on each of our campuses because of the turnover. You know, you're probably a chair for a year, maybe two if we're lucky. So each year there's elections for different positions on campuses, which are very important because we can have a strong board, executive board throughout the state, but if we don't have strong leaders on our campus, we have nothing to do and we're not able to do a whole lot. So very important. I became a college Republican my freshman year, pretty much ran to the St. Thomas Activities Fair to sign up because I was so excited to become a college Republican. And from and there- the Hasek family yeah. guys are, are having <laughs> yeah. Republican meetings for breakfast exactly. when you're younger. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just signed up through there, attended all of the meetings and just developed a love for it. And that's when Andrew decided to run for chair. Mm -hmm. It was probably April of my freshman year, April of his sophomore year, and then I was like, well, hey, maybe I'll run for vice chair, and the opportunity just presented itself. Mm -hmm. And so you were talking about some of the schools in the Minnesota College Republicans. Um, so how many different schools are, are affiliated with the organization? We have 19 campuses. Okay. So we're looking to expand 19, to... and how many roughly campuses do you know are in Minnesota? Do you know I that? I think it's maybe... Maybe 30. Okay, so over half. Four-year schools, mm -hmm. but it's very different with community colleges, and that's something we'd like to reach out to in technical schools, too. Mm -hmm. Because while we might not be able to start a, an official chapter there because of turnover, mm -hmm. if we can just find a way to expand our Republican presence on those campuses, I think it could help move the needle mm -hmm. within our state. So there, there's 19 universities then, or colleges mm -hmm. in Minnesota that are, are part of the Minnesota College Republicans. So then... Um, there's a, an annual convention then? Yes. And when does that usually take place? It's usually end of March, early April, and each year, correct. And how many, um, so each college, do they get a certain amount of, of delegates that they can elect, and how does we, that work? We credential. So each email list, that's kind of the official roster, and for every 10 members you have, you have a delegate. Mm -hmm. So some schools had two delegates, some had 10 mm -hmm. The University of Minnesota actually has like 215 allocated, but they have their own specifications in their constitution where you have to meet certain requirements of attending meetings at your school. St. Thomas has had 48 or 47 delegate spots, but you can only take up 25% of the, of the delegation. So at this last convention, we can only seat 18 of our delegates. Mm -hmm. Which and, was fine. But. And you said so at the at the convention. Then you said there were there was ninety seated delegates. There was or? I think it was seventy five. But then we had some guests and a couple alternates with St. Thomas. Got it. And then each of those people get basically one vote, and then they Correct. vote for uh, whoever they they want to be the next chairperson. Yes, and you. What we do is kind of pick our teams, but you don't run them as a slate. You run them as individual positions. So my co-chair runs separately, my secretary ran separately, and all down the board. And so last year when, when our campaign ran against Danny's, we each picked our own 
spots or we picked people for each position mm -hmm. but this year was a little bit different because i had an opponent for chair but she didn't bring along other positions with her mm -hmm. so it made for a very interesting dynamic hmm. because my the people i picked for my team very well could have ended up with her as their chair hmm. so i have a question i'm not trying to put you on the spot here but you know you said it said something that caught my caught my ear a little bit and that's so each college has an email list and you get mm -hmm. you pick the number of delegates based off that email list is that list like verified or scrubbed yes oh, it we, is. we do send out email blasts and then for bounced ones we do take them out mm -hmm. because i think at one point we went through an email list and there were emails of people who graduated like five years ago ten years mm -hmm. ago we're like we need to clean this out mm -hmm. so do people i mean is there any like finagling like nobody puts in like uh, no we set a of deadline who are to democrats or? where no and not that we're aware of <laughs> but we make sure people submit it early enough so that their delegates register and when the delegates show up we have to cross check to make sure they're on that roster i see i see so andrew y your brother he was the chair during like a non-election year mm -hmm. and we talked about some of the things that he was doing in preparation for the 2014 right. election which uh, I believe is going to be a huge, uh, it's going to be many victories for We're very uh, excited, very energized. Did you feel that energetic. energy at the, at the convention? Yeah, yeah, I would say I did. Just people ready for some change, ready to be on the winning side for, for the first time in our college careers. In 2012, we were out there door knocking, lit dropping, phone banking all the time. And I think we ended up helping roughly 10 different house seats mm -hmm. and then some congressional seats too. Mm -hmm. And Congressman Klein, and Representative Uglum from Champlin were the only candidates, really, I believe, that we'd helped that ended up winning. Wow. So it was just not fun on election night when all these numbers kept coming in, and it's like, oh, will we help them? Are they going to pull it off? Nope, nope, nope. So this year, we're hoping it's a lot different, and we're going to work hard to make sure it is. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned the 2012. What do you think the the, the difference is between 2012 and, and 2014? Is it is it just strictly because it's a non-presidential year? Or I are think you that's hearing part people? of it. But at the same time, I think my generation specifically, the millennials, 18 to 31 year olds, are starting to wake up. I saw a study released, and in early December, or no, early 2013, Obama's approval rating was sitting at 69 percent. But by December, it had dropped to, I believe, 45 percent. Wow. So I think people are finally starting to realize that Obama, his policies are not what's best for America. And I think if we're able to connect those to what the Democrats are doing here in Minnesota, I think that could resonate hmm. with our generation. So, uh, you know, a lot of people are one of the big pushes for uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare is they need young people to sign mm -hmm. up. And you've seen some of the marketing uh, techniques that have gone out there to try to get young people <laughs> uh, interested in, in a, the Affordable Care Act and, and get signing covered, up for their hot mandated chocolate. insurance. Yeah, <laughs> hot chocolate in your <laughs> underpants. And, so as a college student and, and your interactions with your college colleagues and, and those folks at the Minnesota College Republicans, are you seeing that same excitement for Obamacare? It's not on our radar. I mean, most of us, if we're fortunate, are still on our parents' plans. I haven't encountered a lot of people who have had to go out and buy their own. But if they have, um, it's the people that are a couple years older than me and just say, well, now I can't purchase a gym membership because that's how much my premium's going up or people who just aren't signing up because we're young, we're, we've been pretty healthy, and so why pay this extra amount for health care? Yeah, and the, the, the penalty for not signing up isn't too severe for the first few mm -hmm. years of, of affordable care. Then I believe it does skyrocket after that, so yeah. people are going to have to make uh, pretty tough decisions. Absolutely. So what are the issues that not just college Republicans, but college uh, students in general, um, besides for rioting after NCAA uh, <laughs> hockey games, what are the issues that are going to get them excited and to get them out to vote? We've narrowed it down to four that we're going to focus on. Mm. It's going to be the cost of education and, and how available it is for people, the cost of health care, and jobs and the debt. So jobs and the economy are bundled together, but the debt is a very huge one as well. Mm. And big government or intrusive government. Intrusive government's more of a message that resonates rather than big. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it just pulled that younger millennials don't really understand the significance of big government and what that actually means. Hmm. Well, we're gonna talk to Jen Wilson, uh, candidate for the State House, about the Minnesota State issues and, and the issues of the economy, but I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, as a, a college student, 
are, uh, do you see the economy improving, you know, like your brother, Andrew, and, and his class and the class ahead, are they graduating and are they, are they finding the jobs that are going to pay them over 50 grand a year? There's some that, that have been really close to me who have landed an internship in their fall of their senior year and have been offered jobs to carry on. Mm -hmm. But there are some others that are just now searching who have not found one yet. Mm -hmm. I've heard of a couple people from last year, took them till maybe August before they found a job or even later than that and even took a job that didn't really have anything to do with their degree, mm -hmm. but they just took it because they had to. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing a lot of that. and. At St. Thomas, I've been pretty lucky because we have a pretty high job placement, but I know that's not the same amongst all schools. And what about uh, the issue of, of student loans and, and student debt? University of St. Thomas being mm -hmm. a private school, it's fairly expensive. But, you know, if you look across uh, the, other, the, the rest of the state, you know, is, is that issue getting better? Are tuition costs under control? Or are they continuing to increase saw, higher than rates of inflation? Yeah, I actually saw an article, and I can't remember the time period, but I think it was maybe within the last 40 years, it had gone up four times as uh, four, four times more than inflation had, mm. or something like that. I don't know if that mm -hmm. statistic is yeah, exact. Yeah, I've, seen, I've seen some that show, you know, I've looked at various schools, like where I went and my wife went and other people, because we're trying to calculate how much education is going to cost mm -hmm. for our son, Max Million. And, uh, you know, yeah. literally, you, you don't you, even know how to predict it. Yeah, it's, it, yeah, it's going to be very expensive. But if you, I've looked at graphs from 2000 to, to current, and you're right, there's a, a pretty mm -hmm. large increase and in the cost year, of tuition. We get the email that says tuition's going to go up this much per year, mm -hmm. and everyone's always upset. But, you know, after a while, it's like, well, I mean, I guess I saw this coming. But I actually tracked Tim Walls or Congressman Walls last fall, and Education is one thing that he's very proud of, that he's done. But I asked him, I was like, well, Congressman Walls, what are you doing for college students? And he's like, well, I'm making college more affordable by providing you with more loans. And I was like, well, Congressman, if I can't find a job after I graduate, how can I pay back those loans? Mm -hmm. And he didn't know how to answer it. And that really struck me. I mean, the government can give out all the loans that they want, but if they don't create a very welcoming job environment for, for job creators, then what has that benefited me? Mm -hmm. Or how has that benefited me? Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And a lot of the policies that have come to try to fix the, the cost of education have been primarily looking at interest rates and student mm -hmm. loans. And you know what they're really trying to do is to, to lower the rate so that students can borrow more and you know maybe mm -hmm. they get a little bit of relief on the interest that they pay monthly. But what happens when the students are able to borrow more? The, the school universities, raises their price. Yep. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of a, a vicious cycle. And mm -hmm. do, do you uh, have any ideas as to how to reverse that trend? I mean, are alternative education a good idea? Or well, I, schools yeah, or? and my, my younger brother actually goes to a technical school out in South Dakota, mm. and he might make more than my brother, my older brother and I combined when he graduates, and it's because he's going into a very catered job market that he will be able to find a job within two hours of graduation, if not before he graduates. And he's got a great internship this summer for um, a business out in South Dakota. And I think a lot of people feel the pressure to go to a four-year school, even if it's not for them. And I really don't think not everyone should be required to go to or expected to go to college. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so looking at 2014, you know, we're talking about the excitement that's generated around everyone's campaign on the mm -hmm. conservative side. And do you guys have specific races that you're looking to help uh, or, or are, there, are you guys still kind of have your feelers out there to see? We haven't narrowed it exactly down, but we're going to help win the Minnesota House back. So I'm not sure if we'll match schools with candidates and have them volunteer for them like one day per weekend mm. and then do like Thursday night for our statewide candidates or something like that because we do want to send government, Governor Dayton to retirement and we want to send Al Franken back to Hollywood. <laughs> so it's mainly the three and then we want to keep our Republican congressmen in Congress. Um, we'll be helping send Aaron Miller to DC. We'll try to send Stuart Mills there too and then Tori Westrom as well. So it's going to be a lot of work, but we're excited and ready for it. Well, maybe you can uh, talk to Jen Wilson yeah, after I'll and uh, <laughs> see if you can organize a door knocking thing. Yes, or lit exactly. Thing. I'm sure would she would appreciate to. that help. <laughs> so you, the Minnesota governor, the U.S. Senate, those mm -hmm. are the two 
pretty big races. Republicans yes. have a number of great candidates mm -hmm. in uh, both those races. And, uh, you know, pretty much all of them have decided, uh, uh, with the exception of few, I think State Senator Dave Thompson, who's running for governor, he said that he'll abide by the endorsement. Uh, Jeff Johnson, county commissioner uh, from Hennepin County, he's also said that he's going to mm -hmm. abide by the endorsement. Um, it, but it's to my knowledge anyway, the rest of the candidates have said that they're right. running in the primary, although they're still working hard with the delegates and, and activists to see if they can get the endorsement mm -hmm. for the Republican Party. Same thing on the U.S. Senate side. Uh, I'm not sure. Chris Dahlberg may be the only one who has said that he's going to abide by the endorsement. So uh, that puts the Minnesota College mm -hmm. Republicans at a bit of a, a decision point because, yeah. you know, is the decision, um, you know, and I know it's probably not solely yours, but you're, you're going to be the chairwoman. Is the decision to, do you have to wait until the primary or do you support who the U.S. Senate candidate or uh, governor's candidate that's endorsed and you help them until the primary and then whoever that person is after that, how, how is that going to work? That's how we are foreseeing it playing out because we are an affiliate of the Republican Party. Um, my concern is that we're going to have college Republicans who support a different candidate and won't want to band together as college Republicans to stand behind the endorsed candidate. So it makes our job difficult because while we could be sending our college Republicans in full support to one candidate, they may be spread out across the board. Mm -hmm. and. I suppose as long as everyone's going after Governor Dayton or going after Senator Franken, that'll help come the fall. But in the meantime, for manpower, it's going to be hard to sort of rally our people. Mm -hmm. Well, in our uh, BPOU, which is in Egan, it's Senate District uh, 51, on the uh, B side, we had Jen Wilson, who's coming on next. She got endorsed unanimously. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the A side, there was a uh, the com competitive endorsement. The delegation was split basically right down the middle. And then they went and had to reconvene. And they did, uh, I think, a total of 21 ballots. Oh, my gosh. Until they finally <laughs> decided that we're not going to be able to come up mm -hmm. with an endorsement. And so both of them are uh, running in the primary. And um, my, question, my question for you is, is, and some other people have brought this up, is the endorsement process as we know it right now within the party, is it, serving its purpose or do you think or do you believe that it needs to be changed? I think there is some purpose to it. You know, the grassroots getting involved at your at your very local level, I think that's very important. But at the same time, waiting until August before we have a nominee, I feel like it's hurting our process more than it's helping. So while I'll stay involved in the endorsement process and everything like that, it's frustrating to to see the candidates well, that not all candidates are the same. Some are going to abide by the endorsement. Some are going to the primary. So it's like for those who are very involved in the endorsement process, they may look at that as being, well, I'm investing all of this time, and for what? Because the person we endorse may not even end up being the nominee mm -hmm. come the fall. So it puts us as college Republicans in a tough position. Yeah, it it's happens often in, in the Democrat Party, the DFL. Um, if you remember uh, Margaret Anderson Keeler, I believe mm -hmm. that's her name mm -hmm. right, she's a state house rep. She was endorsed to be the DFL governor's that's right. candidate. And uh, Governor okay. Dayton, or candidate Dayton at the time, did not take place. And I don't know if he took part in the endorsement or just kind of, you know, but he waited until the, until primary, the primary and essentially launched a campaign with uh, his ex-wife's money and yes. um, did it successfully. It. Mm -hmm. it probably helped that everyone in Minnesota knows Dayton <laughs> from <laughs> yeah. the, the store, from you know, Target. being based right. here and whatnot. Right. But, um, you know, so, it, you know, he ended up winning. Mm -hmm. You know, or is this system maybe just setting it up for uh, the rich um, millionaire trust fund type candidate to, to, to wait until the end and, and bombard the, the primary? Um, I don't necessarily see that as being the case um, because I think fundraising is a really huge aspect of a campaign because it's hard to run a statewide campaign mm -hmm. if you don't have a lot of money, especially when your opponent is raising millions upon millions mm -hmm. of dollars. So I think that's also very very important too and I see all of these candidates spending all of their money and it's like well what if there was one candidate who everyone in Minnesota's money was behind mm -hmm. or every Republican in Minnesota was behind mm -hmm. yeah that's a great point because I know as uh, uh, me as a you know just a small donor I'm not a, a large mm -hmm. donor by no means 
but you know when you have so many candidates and you don't know who's the one who's actually going to be in the general right. election you hesitate you know are you going to really donate a hundred dollars or I want as a college student until I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's like you, you want, they're, they're precious dollars. Yes, it's your money. You yes. know, it's, it's something that you want to use conservatively and, and so to just, just to throw like it all nature. in. Right. But I think maybe you, you bring up a good point that having that primary earlier on before the summer takes mm -hmm. place and then everybody knows who's going to be on the, the general election ballot and everyone who wants to can get behind that person. Yeah, and I think it's confusing for people who are, like watching parades when there are five different Republican candidates mm. in there for governor. I mean, who do you, how do you know who to remember for when the fall comes if you, if really parades are your only exposure to politics yeah. or something like that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, especially typically on, on our side. We don't have so many of those big names mm -hmm. that, that people uh, recognize. Exactly. So, um, having that one person to build that name ID is, is totally, it's key. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to you, too, about, so we have the 2014 elections, and you talked about your relationship to the, the, the state party. Um, mm -hmm. How about the Minnesota College Republicans? What's your relationship like with the various colleges? Are they all completely different? Like the, the CRs and, and University of St. Thomas have this relationship, and at the U of M it's different? Or is there pretty much a universal acceptance amongst the um, colleges in terms of the organization. Yeah, there's very much a universal um, where people get along. I mean, we took a bus out to Washington, D.C. with 50 college Republicans, and so it's fun for people to identify as a Minnesota college Republican. But at the same time, all of our chapters are very different, um, but we all we bond over our similarities, and it just makes it a lot of fun. So I would say that the metro schools really have the most far more opportunities to collaborate with each other and, and see each other more frequently than schools that are outside in greater Minnesota. Mm -hmm. What about, are there organizations that uh, are affiliated with the Minnesota College Republicans that, um, uh, you know, that aren't political or do you work with other groups on certain uh, focused issues? We're or? looking to expand our presence to maybe more business oriented clubs on different campuses. Also, Students for Human Life is a very active club at St. Mm -hmm. Thomas. Um, I know it's sort of the same deal at the University of Minnesota. Um, and all campuses really have a wide variety of clubs that if we can reach out to them, show how Republican policies will benefit them and will get them jobs faster, better, more, better paying jobs, mm -hmm. then I think we might be able to gain some more votes, get people out to vote, um, and have them vote Republican. And what about, do you guys have any interactions or, or debates or, or, or inner fights with the college uh, Democrats? See, I've never had a run-in with the statewide Minnesota Democrats, mm. actually. I think they don't have like a, I don't exactly remember what their national organization is, but the Minnesota organization, I don't, I don't believe, is affiliated with the national. And so we've never really come across them. I know the college Democrats at um, the University of Minnesota are pretty active, but at St. Thomas, they're a pretty small group. I mean, they are, we had a lot of pride last year when we found out that the college Democrats were moving into the classroom that we outgrew as mm. college Republicans. <laughs> so I would say our college Republican presence is a lot, a lot larger than at the University of St. Thomas. But Overall, statewide, they don't have nearly the strength of the organization as the Minnesota College Republicans. Mm. So debates, I've never had that opportunity. Mm. Here, here, here's an idea. You can take it or leave it, but <laughs> uh, maybe you could uh, contact the, 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 one of the college Democrat affiliates and, and jointly uh, host a debate with either the governors or, or the U.S. Senate candidates. That could be very interesting when you have in the, the fall. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, bring a lot of attention, bring a lot of attention to the issues. And, it would. Because we've actually reached out to some of the college Democrats. And, um, you know, it's like sometimes with, with some of the campaigns, you can tell how organized they are with mm -hmm. the response that you get. And we, we've invited some of the college Democrats to come on the show and haven't heard anything from them. I, I'm not sure anyone got my... <laughs> My email, but Maybe they're scared for the fall. <laughs> I, you know, I think it's just, I think they're disorganized because, you know, it's the same thing when we'll reach out to certain campaigns and you don't, you just don't hear anything, right. but then you right. reach out, you know, we invited uh, Mayor Coleman to come on the show. Okay. He wasn't able to do so, but somebody right away got back to us. You yeah. Know, it's like that, Very interesting. That professional part that maybe is lacking in the, the Democratic side. Yeah. <laughs> 
So is there anything, uh, anything else you'd like to uh, tell, tell every, the viewing audience? Um, because we're going to be bringing on uh, Jen Wilson here pretty soon. Yeah. So. Just if anyone wants to visit our website, it's mncr.org. We're in the process of sort of switching over our information with our new board members and things like that. But there is a donate button there as well. So if you are interested, um, we could use all the support we could get for this fall. I think it's going to be a great year. We're excited. And the more help we can get, the better. Great. Angie Hesick, thank you, Chairwoman, thank you for, for coming on the show. Me. I appreciate, I appreciate that. it. Yeah, thank you. Good luck with everything thank in, you. in the year. So that was uh, Chairwoman Angie Hesick talking about the Minnesota College Republicans. And, uh, yeah, she had a lot of great ideas, a lot of energy. I'm really excited to see what uh, this organization is going to be capable of uh, these, next coming, uh, these next coming years because it's absolutely vital for uh, – conservatives and for diverse parties to, to reach out to these college campuses because otherwise many many of the students will just uh, by default pull the the lever for either the incumbent or the democrat and without even really knowing what it is exactly that they're they're voting for it seems too often uh, that they vote for the rhetoric versus the actual policies and and you know what can come about from those policies but speaking of the college i just wanted to bring up dallas if you can show the uh, the website here i was listening to the to the sue jeffers show on the way here as i usually do uh, Sue broadcasts on Twin Cities uh, News Talk Live, and, and she has a show at 3 o'clock uh, on the radio station. But she was talking about the, the riots on the University of Minnesota campuses, and I just thought that these pictures uh, were pretty hilarious from the city pages. I'll kind of just scroll down. But the Gophers, University of Minnesota Gophers, they uh, made it to the championship. They won Thursday night, the hockey team. And uh, there were some sporadic riots that took place. And, and here's some of the pictures that uh, the city pages found. Uh, let's see, there's riot police taking pictures with University of Minnesota students, scantily clad. There's uh, a selfie here with a, a riot police officer. Looks like some real serious work that's going on here. And then maybe it gets seri more serious as the night goes on. But, you know, it just looks like some dancing. And I guess there was a little bit of property damage done, which is absolutely a crime and should be uh, punished, but it's overblown. You, you see uh, the police have issued uh, warnings. There's gonna be 300 full riot gear uh, policemen on, on, in Dinky Town tonight, and they're warning people to not take part in any riots should the Gophers win or lose or playing in the championship tonight. But they've also said that uh, even if you're out there not doing anything, if you're just out there, uh, in the area where people could be rioting, you're guilty by association, and you could be subject to arrest. Which uh, Sue was talking about, I really planted some seeds. It, it's it's you know it's a safety thing, you know, balance. You want safety, but at the same time, do you really want uh, anyone just to be randomly arrested for being around people who are doing something that's not legal? It's it's scary thing, and just something to keep in mind as uh, you know. This is this is uh, progressing here, but.